Hello, my name is Daydreamer Dan, and roguelikes don't suck. With the recent Game Awards announcement that Hades 2 was in development, my mind went into two different places. One, ah, I'm so excited! And two, there's going to be a very vocal percentage of people out there who are going to be very upset about another roguelike. A few months ago, this tweet was going around the video gaming hemisphere. Hemisphere? I don't think that's the right word. Sphere. I hate roguelikeification of indie games. I hate that every indie game has to be procedurally generated levels and a thousand hours of replay value to be considered worth the money. Please give me a hand designed complete single player experience. I'm begging you. So there's a lot to unpack there. Let's start off by looking at the date of the tweet. I don't know if I'm pointing at the right place. This was posted at the end of August. And would you like to give a guess of what video game, what indie game came out that triggered this particular response? That's right! If you guessed Cult of the Lamb, congratulations! You either paused the video and googled roguelikes that came out in August of 2022, or, like me, you are foaming at the mouth to be just a little guy who starts a cult and kills demons, like Jared Leto, but somehow still less creepy and problematic and with better music. You might be wondering, what the hell is a roguelike? Wikipedia calls roguelikes a subgenre of role-playing computer games traditionally characterized by a dungeon crawl through procedurally generated levels, turn-based gameplay. Wait, uh, uh turn-based gameplay, gr grid-based movement, and permadeath. Okay, uh, so maybe the traditional definition of what a roguelike is isn't super helpful. I mean, even this Wikipedia article is saying that common examples of new roguelikes like Spelunky and Hades are referred to roguelites or roguelike likes, which is honestly the most mouthful. Mouthful? That's not the word I'm looking for. <laughs> which is honestly one of the most wordy, complicated ways to describe a video game. To bring it down to simplistic terms, in this video, I think we'll be referring to roguelikes as a game that features permadeath, which means that if you lose all of your health or your lives, you have to restart the game or the run. Roguelites, which are a subset of roguelikes, still include that permadeath, but they also include some sort of overall progression that carries over from run to run. So Hades is a roguelike because if you end up running out of all of your lives and hitting zero HP because of that Kendall bastard Theseus Die! and his cheap ass moves, you end up on the first level of hell again. However, it's also a rogue light because of the darkness system, which allows you to unlock traits from run to run that carry over, such as being able to do more damage if you attack someone from behind, being able to dash more, or unlocking more lives, which you can use against that piece of Theseus because once again, he got the Demeter boom, and I can't land a single goddamn hit on his little blonde head. Now, to quickly play devil's advocate, I want to look at this argument for a second from the good old OP's perspective, just because I want to see why they could potentially be this frustrated. So I decided to do a little bit of research. At the time of writing the script, if you go on Steam and search roguelike, you'll end up finding over 3,000 titles under that alone. The term roguelike has become a buzzword, often used to help sell video games because it has built-in replayability. Probably the reason why Binding of Isaac, arguably one of the founding fathers in the the roguelike category as we know it today still averages about 12k players a month, despite the fact that the first game came out in 2011. And the same reason why Vampire Survivors, a simplistic pixel art auto battler, getting a mobile port was literally one of the most hype announcements during a gaming award ceremony. A mobile port got me super excited. I went to Seattle to visit my brother for his birthday, and literally during one of my flights, I just played Vampire Survivors for three whole hours. I genuinely lost track of time. I've never felt more like an iPad kid in that moment because the guy next to me was literally reading a book. He also did have sunglasses on, so that was kind of weird. But for every Vampire Survivors that does come out, there are literally dozens of other roguelike games that try to follow that same formula. Whether it's Zombie Survivors, Hunter Survivors, Marine Survivors, Hentai Survi- Wait, what? Wow, this is literally the most boring game I've ever seen. Also, how is this hentai? <laughs> anyway, you, you get the point. For every successful game that does come out, there are a thousand others that try to ride its coattails. Keeping that in mind, let's look at what OP is trying to argue. Is roguelikeification of video games an actual thing? So finding out if this is actually happening is pretty much impossible. It's very, very difficult to tell if this is an industry-wide issue. So instead, trigger warning, we're gonna do a little bit of math. 
These are blue light glasses, but they make me look smarter. So as of December of 2022, there were nearly 50,000 games on Steam, 11,000 of which just came out in the last year alone. This unfortunately doesn't include other distribution sites such as Epic Games or itch.io. There's no way I'm slogging through 50,000 games, 1,335 of which are just porn. Wait. That's it? Wow, that's only like 2% of games. I'm actually kind of shocked. So instead of clicking through every single game on Steam and trying to figure out if it is a roguelike or not, I decided to use the definitive way to try and figure out if something is part of the cultural zeitgeist. Welcome to Watch Mojo. No oh, way! Oh, 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 Looking at the best of indie games of 2022 lists from gaming review websites that I've never heard of. Also Forbes. Now looking at these lists may not be the best indication of an entire subset of games, uh, indie games in this case. However, online lists like these at least show us what games people are talking about and what they have their eyes on. If the roguelikeification of indie games was actually happening, we should be able to see this reflected in the lists of games that people are talking about as well. So I looked at seven different best indie games of 2022 lists, as well as the gaming award nominees for best indie game. From there, I tried to find out which games would be considered roguelikes and which ones would not be considered roguelikes. Across those seven different lists, there were 48 games that were mentioned in total. Of those 48 games, seven were, according to the Steam tag system, which I know is not the most reliable system in the world, considered either roguelikes, roguelites, or action roguelikes. Cult of the Lamb, Vampire Survivors, Sifu, Rogue Legacy 2, Have a Nice Death, Curse to Golf, and Betrayal at Low. Of these seven games, Cult of the Lamb was mentioned five out of of eight of these lists, including one nomination from the Game Awards. Vampire Survivors also appeared on 50% of the list, four out of the eight, and Rogue Legacy and Sifu tied at three out of eight, with the latter also getting a nomination from the Game Awards. The other three games mentioned only showed up once out of the eight lists. The interesting takeaway is that even though these games make up about 16% of the list, they were not the most prolific games. There was only one game that actually showed up on all eight different lists, including the Game Awards nomination nominees, which was Tunic, a love letter to classic adventure games like Legend of Zelda, where you have to play a little fox who has to embark on a story-rich adventure full of combat, puzzles, and exploration. The second most mentioned, at 6 out of the 8 lists, was Stray, a game where you play a cat living in a post-apocalyptic world, where you have to embark on this great journey, solve puzzles, and try and explore a world that is somewhat strange yet also familiar at the same time. Although Cult of the Lamb did come in third place, showing up in 5 out of the 8 lists, it actually did tie with another game, Signalist, a survival horror game inspired by classic Resident Evil where there's a lot of shooting and puzzles. Even more interesting was that the roguelike tag was not even the most common tag out of those 48 video games. Now a quick stipulation, I know that you can't compare the roguelike tag with certain things such as genres like noir or dark fantasy or aesthetics like pixel graphics and atmospheric or ones that are just cat. However, we can compare it to other gameplay related tags. While roguelike only applied to seven different games, platformer applied to nine. Puzzles, exploration, and simulation, which includes dating sims, life sims, etc, etc, all showed up around 11 times. RPGs at 17. And finally, adventure, which applied to 26 different games on that list. So purely coming from an empirical standpoint, although roguelikes did make up a prevalent amount of the newsworthy games this past year, they weren't even the most prolific gameplay aspect based off of Steam tags. However, you don't see people making tweets like, God, I hate puzzles. Puzzles are ruining indie games. Get rid of exploration. I hate simulation. Get away. <laughs> what the hell am I saying? See, this sounds ridiculous, yet somehow it's okay when it applies to roguelikes. So why would our caps lock loving friend here believe that roguelikes were taking over video games? The availability heuristic. Yeah, it's a fun word. You've probably heard of availability bias or recency bias at some point in your life. If you haven't, here's what it is. You may think that shark attacks are super common or that you might have a good chance of winning the lottery because you just saw a news story of someone in your town winning or that Bastion is the most overpowered character right now in Overwatch because he just killed you 20 times before you even had a chance to cap the first point. All three of these statements, my friends, are actually incorrect. And the only reason 
why you believe they're true is because of the availability heuristic. When we as human beings try to evaluate a certain topic or decision, we often believe that something that is really easy to remember is actually going to be more important than alternative options. This often leads us to relying on vivid or recent memories when it comes to making decisions. The odds of getting bitten by a shark is less than 1 in 3 million. The odds of winning a Powerball drawing is less than 1 in 292 million. And Bastion, as of season 2 of Overwatch, is the 10th least chosen hero. I'm sorry to tell you that Bastion is not a good character, you just suck at playing Lucio. Oh! We create these false beliefs because they are often the strongest or most easiest for us to remember. Now applying this to OP's tweet and to many others who are anti-roguelike, it makes sense why they might be upset about these games. I remember when Hades came out and it was the only indie game people talked about for a very long time, even into the following year. And now this game with a cute little lamb and similar gameplay aspects comes out just a few years later and it's all the internet can talk about again? Now Hades may not have been the specific turning point for the OP, but we can see a potential source of why the OP created this false belief. And if you're a staunch lover of video games that give you a good single player experience, then you may be upset that games like Hades or Cult of the Lamb have been in the limelight for a very long time purely because of the fact that people can keep playing it for months and months and months. You may think that these are the games that are most prolific. However, this is just another fallacy that's created by our primitive minds. Hi, cat. I need you to get down, Cricket. Now, moving on past the claims of roguelikeification. By the way, this word is losing all meaning. It already had no meaning, but it has even less of one. It has negative meaning. Roguelikes aren't all dungeon crawlers. Yeah, yeah, I know the big roguelikes that I've spoken about so far have been Hades and Cult of the Lamb. Yeah, they are in fact dungeon crawlers. They do have procedurally generated levels. You are right, the, ish, the, the OP is correct about that. However, you do have to remember that roguelikes are not just dungeon crawlers. The games in the ro- Hi. Uh, Cricket wants to sit on my lap real quickly, so we're taking a quick- Thank you. The games in the roguelike cinematic universe extend far beyond dungeon crawlers. We have chess pieces, shooting shotguns, and restaurants filling out orders, and rent paying lottery machines, and adventurers relying on their backpack, dice based combat, animal emoji battlers, RPG peggle. Roguelikes are more than just Legend of Zelda ripoffs. I would doubt that anybody who sees Risk of Rain 2, a 3D shooter, and Inscription, a deck building roguelike, would go, yeah. Those are the same game! Sure, there are some roguelikes that definitely don't tweak the formula that much. However, these are rarely the noteworthy ones that people are talking about or want to play. No one is talking about those vampire survivor clones that I brought up earlier in the video, except for maybe that hentai one. I, I do want to come back to that. Instead, they're talking about games like Sifu. While I did end up getting a free copy of Sifu, by the way, it's really freaking cool. It came with this really cool box. I'll put a photo of it right here. Dan, remember to put a photo. Thanks. It was one of the most inventive roguelikes that I've ever had a chance to play. For those of you who don't know, Sifu is a 3D beat-em-up game where you play a kung fu student who has to go through five different areas to try and defeat the people who killed his master. And not only is it a great story, but it also has astonishing art style, an amazing soundtrack, and gameplay that I have not played ever. I mean, look at this corridor sequence just by itself. Not only is it an homage to old kung fu movies, but it's fun as hell. It also had an incredibly unique permadeath system. If you hit zero HP in this game, you don't actually die, but instead you get older. Prior to getting resurrected, you can get new upgrades, which kind of play into that rogue light aspect of the game. And your fighting skills do end up getting better and hitting harder once you are resurrected. The true permadeath actually comes once you hit the age of 70. Due to this fact, you may attempt to do the first level again just so that you don't die as much. And while it is the same enemies in the same place, there are different paths that you can take, different weapons that you can use, different upgrades that you can give to your character and permanently unlock so that you have new ways to kick the butts of some bad guys. It's honestly just a fantastic game and I'm so excited to play it probably after I'm done recording this video. Sifu is a perfect example of a game that breaks that roguelike formula and makes it such a new and wonderful experience. Now, while I am love bombing roguelikes that have broken away from that procedurally generated roguelike feel like Hades or Cult of the Lamb, I wanna talk about Hades and Cult of the Lamb. 
Roguelikes can be complete experiences. I know, I know, I just had that whole hashtag not all roguelikes are dungeon crawler spiel. However, I wanted to focus on the last part of that tweet for this part of the video. Please give me a hand-designed single-player experience. While Hades and Cult of the Lamb are procedurally generated and have thousands of hours of replayability, these are not just to get the money's worth out of the game. The roguelike gameplay is meant to enhance the other parts of the game, not be the overwhelming flavor. Yes, Hades is a dungeon crawler. However, it has amazing characterization and full voice acting, bringing these stylized versions of Greek gods to life in a way that I've never seen. That was a really nice surprise the first time I got to play Hades was actually seeing a god that kind of looked like me. Hold on, let me try and recreate what Hermes looked like. That was really bad. On top of that, the music is phenomenal and moving. The relationship system brings so much character and the growing story with each victory brings an unforgettable experience to the player. But Hades isn't the only one to get this formula correct. Fun fact, did you know that you can actually beat Cult of the Lamb? Without attempting to spoil the story too much, you can actually defeat the five bosses of the game and then unlock the final option to either continue or just end the game. And while you can replay the game and go through the dungeons that you already did, that's mostly for collectibles and to unlock new items that potentially can be added to your cult's village. And speaking of these unlocks, let's talk about the village building. As someone who loves a challenge, I mostly played through the game so that I could go through the crusades and defeat each boss. However, while I played the game for the first few weeks after it came out, I saw many other streamers who were playing it much, much later because they were delving in deep into the village building aspect of the game. Game. That alongside with the uniqueness of each cult member having different personality traits, the adorable NPCs that you meet along the way, you can understand why this game would end up getting a nomination for best indie game of the year. To simply write off roguelikes as just procedurally generated dungeons completely writes off all of the other genres that are within the roguelike category. Whether they're turn-based or shoot-em-ups, deck builders, metroidvanias, tower defense, rhythm games, and much 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 more. And many of these do have great stories. Saying you don't like roguelikes because you're singling out the experiences where people only play it for the replayability is like saying that you don't like music because you heard the song Earth by Little Dicky. The minus is huge. <laughs> Actually, I might not like music after that. What I'm trying to say is that just because you didn't like one roguelike doesn't mean that there isn't one out there that would match up with you. And to close out the video, let's look beyond the roguelike games. This tweet greatly ignores some of the amazing indie games that come out this past year that fall under their pleas for a hand-designed complete single-player experience. Welcome to the final part. You're ignoring all these games. I was so scared that I was going to fall. As I said earlier, where are my glasses? This is, we're going back to the math part for a second. There are 48 different games that were listed across all eight of those lists for the best indie games of 2022. And so many of them were fantastic single player games. Stray came out just shy of a month prior to this tweet. Stray, the game that ended up winning the best indie game of 2022 at the Game Awards. The game that sold over 3 million copies and grossed over $75 million. The game that has no procedural dungeons, very little replayability outside of a collectible and one of the most heart-touching stories I've had a chance to play in the past decade. And just because Cult of the Lamb came out three weeks later, you think that indie games have no story-rich narratives anymore? And while I've not played Tunic or Neon White, the other two games that were nominated for the Game Awards, I do know how much these games mean to other people. There are so many unforgettable indie games out there. I still have that list of 48 games. I'm probably going to put it below in the description so that you guys can see what was considered the best best indie games of 2022, but that's kind of besides the point. Instead, I want to talk about why I made this video. I didn't make this video so I could hate on the tweet, or to say that roguelikes are the best video games out there right now, or that you should play any of the games that I gushed about. But when I saw this tweet and I ended up seeing that it got almost 65,000 likes on Twitter, I was genuinely confused. As a kid without much money growing up, Binding of Isaac was one of my favorite games of all time. And this was because the replayability. It was challenging but still entertaining every single run, and just being able to see all the different 
different synergies between the power-ups was actually a skill that I ended up building and applying to other video games in the future, and since then, I got to see how this genre just got to build. Roguelikes went from cookie-cutter dungeon crawlers to some of the most unique and diverse games out on the market right now. And in my humble opinion, boiling down all of those games to just procedural generation and replayability would be a huge crime. Cult of the Lamb is a complete experience, no matter if you played 2 hours of it, 20 hours of it, or 200 hours of it. And while other roguelikes may not have the same level of depth, they often twist the formula by adding additional elements such as turn-based combat or survival. The individual gameplay pieces come together to make something greater than the sum of its parts. And yes, I understand that it can feel a bit frustrating to see another game with randomized levels and enemies and upgrades, but at the end of the day, while I do love the intense and heartwarming story of Stray, sometimes I just want to play a quick round of Super Auto Pets on my phone, and roguelikes can cover so many different aspects. So what I'm trying to say is, roguelikes don't suck. Thanks for listening, and make sure to go play a roguelike, because you know that I probably am.